about to meet together to study the scriptures, especially the book of Acts. We bless, we ask that you to bless him that you will be able to present the things that you placed upon his heart to teach to us, help us to be able to participate and get a lot out of it. And we're thankful again for everything that we have in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You're a good man. I don't care what your grandpa says. I think you're a good man. Well, I trust you all had a pretty happy holiday weekend. Merry yeah, Merry Christmas. Yep, yep. It was amazing. With our family, though, it seemed like it was never going to end. <laughs> yeah, it started back in the, the last of November and the first of December. We had two babies brought into our family that's just within within a week and a half of each other it's so cool i just now started holding one of them you know babies are too fragile their necks are going all over the place i'm afraid i'm going to get whiplash or something so it bothers me so but uh actually one of them i've held and and it works out pretty good so i'll get more courageous Excelsior Springs, huh? What is it about Excelsior Springs that recommends itself to you? Lots of dogs. <laughs> yeah, that's a, we haven't been up there a time or two. Am I doing something wrong? Could you hear it? I couldn't hear it. Yeah, that was a reminder to me that I've got a, uh, my, my phone was off too. I've, I've got a, uh, uh, a prayer time that, and I didn't get it this morning, but at 9.50 in the morning, I prayed with a couple I know. And, um, this time I missed. So thank you for your prayer, Lyle. All right, um, I, I get interested in certain phrases and certain conditions and things, and I start asking questions. I think that was a problem I had in my whole school career. I asked too many questions. But in the first two chap verses of chapter 13, there's a real interesting exchange. And you know, before I go there, I want to, the Restoration Church is really strong on authority. It's strong on who does what for whom kind of thing. And so we've had these set rules that if somebody's going to be called to the priesthood, they have to meet this criteria. It has to do this and then this and then this. And if you don't, it isn't really accurate. It isn't, a, it isn't of God. And... You know, we've had, like most people think, we've had 12 apostles. And the Protestant churches, I'm not degrading them, but they they were actually of the mindset that what we do, to what the old church did first century after Christ, we can't possibly replicate because it, all the apostles, the original apostles and, and Jesus, they've all gone. And our... Restoration theology says that we were restored from the whole, from the beginning, and everything was set in order. Well, because it's called order, some people think that they have to be the controllers of that order. You, you following me? All right. And because of that, they don't accept certain things. In fact, we've even had arguments over certain things and fights over certain things. So I'm reading in this chapter 13 and it says Paul and Barnabas are called by the Holy Ghost and that really intrigues me but even more so as I read let me read this and I want you to just think about the names I'm calling and how many of them how many of those people you actually can recognize okay now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunder I have called them, whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Now we've got about five or six names listed there. How many of them do you recognize? I, that's what I got, uh, two, Barnabas and Saul. And you, I'm thinking maybe Simeon somewhere. I don't know for sure where he comes in. But um, it's interesting. What did these people do that had a profound impact on the entire rest of the New Testament as well as the entire Christian church? Right, but, but these, these men that we mentioned were told by the power of the Holy Ghost to what? Ordain. Ordain Paul or Barnabas and Saul. Now, there's no tracing back of their lineage back to Joseph Smith, Jr. There's no tracing back of their lineage back to Adam that we understand. There's no council of the twelve to which these people apparently had to answer. They did this under the unction of the Holy Ghost, which means that somehow they were able to ordain Saul, who became Paul, who became an apostle, without knowingly recording the authoritarian line through whatever organization, ruling, class, or group that they had. Now, doesn't that just throw a kink into what we all have taught and learned and, and thought must be? It goes back to me that uh, by your church, you shall know that. Agreed. They were doing the ministry of the apostle before they were at answer. Mm -hmm. And that's a very interesting concept. So people can be doing things before they even have the mantle of that. And God isn't going to let himself be backed into a corner. He's always going to provide an opportunity for his work to move forward. Now, here you have these guys that they mentioned. But earlier on in Acts, what did they do to replace Judas? cast lots, which is the same as throwing dice, I guess, or something. So are you saying that God allows the choice of one of his primary witnesses to be chosen by a game of chance? And here you have our understanding of authority and suggestion. I'm not saying anything goes. Because right here, it's by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, they believed that those lots were going to demonstrate the truth of whom, was, whom would be called. But we, as men and men in the Restoration, have gotten really hung up on who's in charge. Go ahead. never come to a conclusion of who should take that position. Good point. And, and, and at this time, Paul wasn't even still well accepted abroad. Or, and, and to where was he sent? Abroad. So we see that these guys, now that intrigued me. So I did some research. And that's why I'm going back to 13 and not following up ahead on 14. But um, I don't know whether you know much about Antioch, and I'm not going to give you a historical lesson about Antioch, but uh, uh, in some commentaries, they're saying Antioch was a very large city, okay? And in that city, it says there were certain prophets and teachers. Now, do you suppose all those prophets and teachers met at the same uh, synagogue, church, or building, assembly, at the same place, same time? What do you think? Yeah, yeah that, that all tied into the same. And apparently, the, in, in Antioch, they had these different churches all around, and then they came together. 
And as they came together and fasted and prayed, they had revelation from God. Wow, does that sound familiar? <laughs> so anyway, here we have Antioch, a large city that had many, Christ many Christians in it, and they had many prophets, scribes, and teachers. And Paul was, Saul was named as one of those. Now, um, <clears throat> I don't know. I heard, I heard Paul, and I've read his works. He's pretty scholarly. He's pretty well versed. But he also has something that a lot of us are missing or we haven't searched, and that is he had an understanding that was given him through the power of revelation, and not only revelation, but through the voice of God. And Alma and the sons of Messiah, they're walking down the road. And all of a sudden, the Lord out of the blue strikes him down and starts talking to him. And what he's telling him is, is such a, a, a distressing nature that Alma didn't recover for a period of time. And Paul, walking in the road, I think it was on the way to D Damascus. Uh, anyway, he's walking down the road, and while he's walking down the road, that very same thing happened to him. And, you, you know, we could argue which came first. We know the Bible. But, you know, I bet the timeline is pretty similar to Paul's experience and Alma and the sons of Messiah's experience. And what God does once, he's going to do again to benefit the people that come from behind, or that come after, so they will know that it's possible and that he's still in charge. So that's the whole reason why we have these scriptures, is not so we can determine how we can be in charge, but we can determine how much in charge God really is. So you had these, there's many assemblies, and, and they all assembled together, they called them together, the scriptures call them together, um, Let's see, prophets, scribes, and teachers. So prophecy was known among them even at that time. Now, do you assume the prophets would be bound to one set group? Doesn't make sense. Now, I think I'll get to this in a second, but another thing is they're spread out. And probably more than just spread out, they're spreading out. And I think this is a lesson for us as we read, and especially in the book of Acts, because it tells us they, they, did, they did four, th four things. They fasted, they prayed, they laid hands on the head of Paul and Barnabas, and then they sent them out. Now, we know that they had some kind of learning and some kind of understanding because they were there in that Antioch area, <clears throat> and there were many prophets, teachers, and scribes, many of them. And so they probably learned some things. But you remember in the early restoration, there was a minister. I, I don't know if he was a minister. I can't remember the guy's name. But he came and wanted baptism. And Joseph baptized him. They confirmed him while his clothes were still wet. And then they sent him on his way. And one of the things I really th believe is the biggest, one of the biggest downfalls for our, our, our restoration beliefs is that we baptize them, we lay their hands on them, and then we let them sit. How many times do we have children that are baptized and then they come and sit? Now they go to a class, that's true, but they don't, they aren't taught to go out. And But that's a great commission, isn't it? Matthew, was it 28, that uh, go, go make disciples of all men? I'm kind of not there, but you, you, you see that that I believe that God has a purpose. Now, I also believe that elder in the scriptures it says that priests are to serve the sacrament, but when there's an elder there, they're only supposed to do X, Y, and Z. Now, I believe that that elder, that that branch is not supposed to be full of elders. The elders are supposed to be traveling and that they come to that branch. And when they come to that branch, that elder is to be in charge. But that elder is not supposed to be standing around, even though they can be standing ministers. But they're not supposed to be in the pews every Sunday, which is what we have decided is important for priesthood. And it makes it difficult. Um, Let's see, uh, let's see. Yeah, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. Now these early fathers, they knew that because they had experienced it. It's like trying to get um, your, your kid to eat a certain food and you're just rebellion, rebelling because they don't like the looks of it or the smell of it. But then they taste it and it becomes really special to them. That means something. So here we have all these things going on in Antioch. Who would have thought of Antioch as being a center of, of any kind of religious activity that was godly? But here these men are, so God evidently had a plan for Antioch. And part of that plan was to call ministers. So the men, Barnabas, and one commentary, commentator I was reading, he says, Barnabas, he says, uh, was named first, probably because he was the oldest. And I believe that in certain traditions you name elder as you know the oldest to the youngest so that would mean that Saul was named last because if you're following that thought that he was the youngest but then you follow it through and then Saul became preeminent and everybody else became less and so the last shall be first and the first shall be last and, and it's one of those intriguing things. And I hope I'm not boring you, but this is just exciting to me. It just totally, it, it opens up the whole thing. You know, like, like apples are great, but when you put them in a pie with cinnamon and sugar, man, it really makes it, makes it better. And then Saul, uh, what effect did Saul have on the church? Kind of a, is the Pope Catholic question, isn't it? It's really kind of crazy. And, and he be, when he became Paul, he became a minister. He became an apostle of the gospel of Jesus Christ, an apostle of God. And he went out and did things that others had never done. And in fact, they even had a big rift in the church because of him. I mean, how dare he, or how dare he go to people that were uncircumcised? And yet, when they went to Jerusalem and, and sat before the council, that was exactly the, the thing that they gave him, was that you go to the heathen, the uncircumcised. And, and that was a powerful statement of itself. You know, the Jews believed that God was just for him. And the restoration story, how, do you remember the old um, series, the Go Ye and Teach series? That always flashed a screen up there and... And here's the Catholic Church, and there's the Episcopals, the Baptists, the Methodists, da 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 da. All of these churches, and they're all intertwined back to the Catholic Church. And then they would put up the Restoration story, and you'd have the the uh, the reorganized church it was always by itself. Well, if we were to show a slide like that today, what would the re reorganized church look like? It would look much like the Catholic chart. And we have done that to ourselves because we have not believed strongly enough that God can change, do things and change people's lives. And men are called and ordained. There's, there's prayers, there's the ordination, but there's not much of the sending out. And I believe that's what's really hurting us, is we're not sending out. And I believe if we look at the gospel, Paul and Barnabas, these people at Antioch, that was enlivening to them. It was alive. And that's part of what's happening with me is I've read through the scriptures and I'm thinking, okay, what, what, does he, what do these things mean? And basically, I believe it means that the power of God is available to all people who desire to have that power of God with them. And he's not going to say, well, look, look, Saul, you, 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 you jerk. You, look what you were trying to do to my people. You actually stood and watched one of my special servants get stoned to death. You held the coats of those that were stoning them. How could you even think about being a minister for me and, and doing things in my name? And we haven't had those experiences, but we haven't let those experiences be ours. We've read about them as if it's special. But the spirit of overcoming is great. And when you realize the truth, the repentance that brings upon you is very a very teaching experience mm -hmm. about right and wrong and the right way. But it's also forgiving and freedom and allows you to grow 
and then you can serve the Lord back for how you have harmed him. Mm -hmm. A very good point. A very good point. Tie that into Paul. He was standing there holding the coat of those that were was stoning. Was it uh, Stephen? Now, Paul testified throughout his life that there was a thorn of the fl in the flesh that troubled that that was troubling him. Can you think of anything more thorny than putting to death one of the Lord's servants? who in honesty walked among the children of men to preach the true and full gospel? I think Paul felt he needed to make up for Stephen's ministry. Mm -hmm. Very well put. Maybe, maybe so. And whatever it was, he was motivated to go on. And, and yet, uh, I've done things, and I'm sure you've all done things. You've come to the Lord, you've repented, and you, and you move on. But there's times that it still comes back, and you think, how in the world could I have done such a thing as that? And, and that, I think that's the power of the gospel. When you're asking that question, you're right where God wants you to be. Because he's going to say, look, these things, all things, work to the good of those who are called according, according to his purpose. All things work to the good. So it doesn't matter what you've done. And this is a perfect example. Paul was not a good, a good guy is from the world standpoint. And why did it happen back in the first century uh, A.D. instead of the 21st, 22nd, whatever, 21st century A.D.? You'd be on the Internet and you'd be crucified before you got five words out of your mouth in your defense. So God did what he did. He did it for a reason. Now, this uh, guy Simon is called Niger. And I don't, I, the, Niger has to do with black. And they think that it was because of his black hair that they called him uh, Niger. And uh, I think that there's a phrase, a reference to him as the black prince. And you know, we identified people because of physical qualities, there, or there were some back then. And um, so that's who he was, or the possibility. And this one was really interesting. The Lucius, uh, Lucius the Cyrene, Got it. One commentator, nobody knows who that was. Nobody knows. You got any ideas who it might be? What's Lucius sound like? Luke. Luke. And this one comment, Matthew Henry says that this most, a lot of commentators, and he mentions another guy that was famous, but I mean, in, well, not in, in my understanding now, but he says that he believed that Lucius of Cyrene was actually Luke, the companion of Paul. That isn't, uh-huh. That's interesting. So God, like I said, doesn't leave himself without testimony. And Luke, they went on to say that Luke may have been one of the 70. That, remember that Jesus called the other, other 70 and sent them out? They said Luke may have been one of those other 70. Now, I, it doesn't surprise me. I don't know if I'm not going it, to, it's not important to my faith, to my re, salvation to know that. But it's awfully interesting because it puts it, God in a perspective that there's no stone he leaves unturned. All roads lead back to God. So that's, that's what he was. And it, it's a possibility. But he wrote Acts. He wrote, he wrote the Gospel of Luke. And Paul refers to him later on, Timothy and in the other couple of places, that the only one with me is Luke. So he was a, he was a strong companion. And then this is another guy that was kind of interesting. It's uh, Menaean. And it references uh, he had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. Now, who's Herod? He was a king, but what did he do? Yeah, yeah, and and uh, he beheaded John the Baptist. So here you got this guy that's in in esteem, who was a friend to the guy that killed one of the uh, Christian made John a, a martyr, and yet he's accepted among the people. We talked about this idea of forgiveness. What does that mean? And if people that have done those dastardly things like that could be forgiven and given positions of authority within a group of people, the church. What does that say for what we should do? How many grudges should we hold? <laughs> it could be. It's 28 days in February. 
how many times should we curse our neighbor? How many times should we do this? You, Paul goes on to say, and I think this is born out of his understanding. If you don't have charity, you're of nothing. And Moroni talks about it being the pure love of Jesus Christ, and you're not even going to get into heaven if you don't have it. So these witnesses are there. They're not specifically saying this, but based on what they were doing and how they had risen, and I'm not saying this is arrogance, but risen to prominence within the church, obviously says forgiveness is a big part of who God is. Now, you know, if you've been baptized, God says, I'm going to fight your battles. He also says, with those stripes, you're going to, or with my stripes, you're going to be healed. So we got Paul, who understood that. And he didn't dwell in this deep, dark pit. He, he most likely had feelings from that. I know people were talking about you know, all sorts of things and describing it to him, but I'm thinking that probably the most disastrous thing he did was to be there while Stephen was being slain. And then you had Alma and the sons of Mosiah. Their testimony was they went out and they were, they were like murderers because they went out to destroy the church of God. And then they're walking down this road one day, and boom, the lightning from God came down, hit them, and they were, Paul, or Mosiah, Alma couldn't talk for like three days. It was very similar to Paul's experience. And, and then out of that three-day three experience, he came out praising God. First of all, he's probably pinching himself. It's, I made it. I'm still here. I'm okay. You know, the magnificence of God, we're, we miss it. Yes. But during that out time with Alma, he was drawn to the remembrance of teachings of his father. Mm -hmm. Good point. And it's interesting it mentions that. You know, the sons of Ahinaman said they knew their mothers knew. So here you have, I think that's a very good point, the teachings of his father. And that's, that's an important concept there. Is it one over the other as far as a husband and wife? Or is it a team? And they have each input that is necessity, necessary for the total growth of the body, of the, of the family. So I believe the family is God's workshop. And that's where they learn their fundamental basic and, and basic beliefs. So it says that they went on, they ministered to the whole, they ministered to the Lord, they ministered to the Lord and fasted. And then the Holy Ghost said, Separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work where under where unto I have called them. And it was it was they call they were called to be sent out. And in that day, those that were sent out with a special testimony of Jesus Christ, which Saul certainly had, were apostles. Now my big point is who among these brethren did we know that had authority to do that? They all did because they were given authority by the power of the Holy Ghost. You think of the baptism of, of Joseph and, and uh, Oliver. Who, who was it? Didn't, didn't, uh, one, didn't Oliver baptize Joseph and then Joseph baptize Oliver? But who gave, who gave Oliver authority to baptize in the first place? Yeah. And if we're going to deny the Holy Ghost and the inspiration that comes, why do we even bother meeting? You know, we contribute to a church for a purpose, and that's to, to have funds to win souls to Christ. But it's a, Paul even said it, if, if there is no Christ, we of all men are most assuredly cursed. We don't have any hope. So we meet because of the hope. And that hope doesn't extend, it isn't because of who we are, it's because of who God is. And if we are baptized and, and given and, are, and confirmed, we are God's. We're no longer called by our name. We're called by the name of Jesus Christ. That also should tell us a little, under, a little bit about how we should act. And you talk about we're called by the name of Jesus Christ. Paul, I love some of his writings. He says, what? Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? How important is that? 
And what do we allow our body, and I'm not even talking about food, I'm talking about thoughts and actions and things of that nature, what do we do? It just, it, 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 we give into these things and it's a crazy, crazy uh, attitude that we've woven is that the world revolves around us and we're the important ones. Um, now again, what about the calling? It doesn't say anything else. It doesn't say anything about uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, testifying that they knew, but they had to have known. Based on what they chose to do, they knew that they, they knew that Jesus was the Christ. They knew what they needed to know, and when they went out, they shared that which they knew. And then that's why I look at these scriptures. And I get I get really taken away, and I spend a lot of time spend a lot of time thinking about it, because that means something, and you can draw a whole lot out of this. And first of all, that you know Herod the Tetrarch, okay, he's a friend of Herod. Herod killed John the Baptist. Herod, I think it was his dad, wasn't it, that sent out um, the guys to kill Jesus. And um, but that was the that was the kingly line. So Manan was. That he, he, he says that he had been brought up with Herod. Did that mean that he and Herod were next door neighbors, the best buddies? Or does it mean that he... They knew each other. Oh, absolutely knew each other. And probably they had some kind of royalty together within them. Because what king or king's son hangs out with a commoner? It's unusual. So you, we think about this stuff and, and I, I think, wow, how powerful is this? Because we've often assumed that you have to be rich and famous in order to be doing anything worthwhile in this world. And sometimes it's just the common folk like me that can do stuff that's phenomenal. And, and I praise the Lord that he's done that for us. So here he's, he's uh, uh, the, the church came together. And uh, Paul was told, too, in his later life that he was called to the Gentiles to take the gospel to the heathen. And it wasn't too much longer after 13, 14, that the Bible, the New Testament, takes a turn. And it's not so much anymore the acts of the apostles, but the acts of Paul the apostle. And I believe that God chooses people like that he chooses people like that to tell you that he's patient. And it doesn't matter where you are, I can do things for you that you can't even imagine. Just surrender. Surrender your life to him and submit your will to him. And that's the challenge we have today, is for this to happen. Uh, and then you, another one, if you jump over to the 22nd verse, he says, and when he had removed him, he raised it up unto him David, after he removed Saul, the king, to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, a son, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Can, what kind of an elevation to a person's title or being is that? A man after his own heart. Wouldn't that be one of the coolest things to have said of, said of us? And really meant it really understood and meant that we are people after God's own heart and then we, we quote David and and God used him but was David a perfect man <laughs> absolutely not but God's grace is sufficient and it's all pervasive so David is spoke to, spoken of highly uh, and then you talk about, you know, this is another thing. Remember in the Book of Mormon, Alma was the chief judge, and there was a guy who came, was a Korhor, something, and he'd been preaching. He thought he was, he was pretty good with words, and he thought he was going to be able to control the, the thing. And Alma finally said, look, if you don't shut up and, re, and, and what, what you're saying and you repent, you're going to be struck d dumb. Yeah. And he didn't, and he was struck dumb. Well, what about all the people that was watching that? What do you think their faith in, that, in, the, in their God just did at that particular time? 
and then how it just that that time meant something but to for people like us if god can do that once he can do it again and if he brings people through what they go through there's a purpose for it and how would it be how can it be a blessing and it will be a blessing we if we sit down and think about it we don't think it well, who who is it that wants to cause division Lucifer, Satan, the adversary, the, the, the uh, enemy of all righteousness. And what you said about forgiveness early on, Woody, I was thinking, do we have a responsibility to forgive ourselves? Yes. Why? Mm -hmm. well. To accept the covenant that we entered into with the Lord. Absolutely, at baptism we said we want to follow you. Right. And if forgiveness and repentance, if forgiveness is there, we have, if we're going to forgive people, we've got to forgive ourselves. Because we know what we've done, and we know that what we've done is worthy of death, but because of the grace of Jesus Christ to those who have said, I want to follow you, we're in a different, different uh, class. It's not that we can go out and do, that's what Paul says. He said, uh, what? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Key phrase. I, I just think from what I'm listening, a lot of us don't realize God did this for us. And Paul was called into the ministry without um, the uh, apparent blessing of the higher-ups. But you know they accepted his ministry, for when he went to Jerusalem, he argued in favor of taking the gospel of the Gentiles, and then the leader, James, finally said, look, this is what I'm telling you. Let Paul go do his thing, and let Peter do his thing. So there's a two-pronged thing for the church right there in the New Testament. One, sustain the body. Two, find new bodies to sustain. That's our job. And the whole reason why our church grew the way it grew in the beginning was because of the outward ministry that they did. They went out and did things. Read stories in the church history of of ministers walking around in suit coats and taking their coats off, off and putting them on a fence post and climbing the fence and helping the farmer plow his field. They weren't just standing around, let's do this, you know, let's talk about it. They were doing the work while they were doing the talking. And that's part of who we should be and what we should be doing. And that was one of the reasons why our church was so, so powerful early on in independence to even have the uh, social service center where we provided for people, and it, and uh, there were there were other things too. The purpose of the oblation. I've talked to some pastors that say our our oblation fund is like thirty thousand dollars, and I'm thinking, what? <laughs> you can't find somebody. And and I remember back when I was at uh, uh, um, in the center stake, uh, there was a couple that needed help, and we went and sought uh, oblation funds for them. Well, are they members? Have they paid their tithing? Are they doing this or that? Well, no, but they certainly need some help that we don't. All, we can't all provide. And the, after the church was very strict with that, you had to have certain things that happened. And the reason I, I bring all this up is that I'm a rebel. I seriously am a rebel. So much so that the last principal under which I worked at school, when she came on to the job, I went into her office not you know pushing but I went into her office we sat down and I was just wanting to get to know her and I wanted her to know me and I said look I'm a rebel at heart <laughs> I said you're gonna say some things and I'm just gonna reject it and whatever but I said I I really want to do what's right and I want to be under the authority of leadership but my default setting is rebel and maybe that's why I've, I've adopted some of these things, but I know protocols are necessary for people to really know who is who. But if we don't have the Spirit of God motivating us in those protocols, what difference does it make? 
we'll end up like some of the we'll end up like a lot of churches and and we'll have a form of godliness but our hearts are far from him so it's a constant battle for me to not be a rebel and some of those rebel things tie into this thing that happened maybe that's why i really got interested in it with paul who ordained him under what authority and the only authority that matters is the power of the holy ghost which comes from god and that's what we need to do is and and if we are discerning we'll find that out and you know just as another thing now i've gone far astray from the 13th chapter but joseph smith actually told protestant people ministers i want to convert you to my way my way being the way of god and he says but if by debate and discussion and study i cannot convince you that my way is right then i will help you become the very best at what you can be or at what you want to be i will help you do that and we don't hear that from the ministry in the church today i've heard at one time that, that you know about atherton down in the, the bottoms they had a lot of church property down there and one of the men that attended there a long time told me that uh, he said uh, there was a man there that um, gave money to the Methodist Church and the Methodist Church was struggling and he says they don't have the fullness of the gospel but there are a lot of people that are coming to Jesus and coming to learn about Jesus in their sanctuary. And I want to be able to help them. And so he would constantly give money to the Methodist church. He didn't look at them as adversaries. He looked at them as Jesus looked at them when his disciples said, hey, look, Jesus, these guys are out there. They're healing the sick. They're, they're, they're doing all these miracles. And they don't even belong to us. Who are they? Why can they do, how can they do that? Jesus said, what? Let's go out and beat them. Let's call down the, the power of heaven and destroy them. Leave them alone. If they're not against us, they're for us. There's so many testimonies. Yes. Ron? You're welcome if you'd like. I don't know if this is on. It is. Okay. Um, so many things have gone through my mind, especially about this gospel we're studying. These people were chosen because somebody had to record this. It had to be somebody knowledgeable. It had to be somebody that was acquainted with what was going on and aware of the times because they described in detail things inside the temple. Mm -hmm. They described rulers, uh, head, I guess they would call them theolog theologians, prominent Jews, politicians, and they got it all right. Historically, it was right. But then 70 years later, the temple was destroyed. So it had to have been somebody who was there at the time and somebody educated. You had scribes, you had Pharisees, you had your, they were like your lawyers and your recorders of deeds nowadays, but they were educated and they could write. So someone had to follow along and record this in detail, otherwise we wouldn't be studying this. And yeah, the Jews had the, the Old Testament, the Torah, and they still do, but somehow this gospel of Christ had to get to the Gentiles and it took kind of a circuitous, it mm -hmm. took a long way around from Hebrew to Greek to Latin to Gutenberg and Luther and German and then to English. <coughs> and we're still studying it. This is a miracle in itself, this book in front of you. Very good point, <laughs> very good point. And then talking about Paul and how he was there when Stephen was crucified, well not crucified, killed, Stone, stoned. Yeah. In chapter 14 coming up, Paul suffers the same fate. And this was a very efficient manner of execution in those days. You didn't survive this. 
And things nowadays aren't that much different. You might remember the riots in California. The fellow was pulled out of the truck and the of him yeah. on his head. Mm -hmm. You might look in other parts of the world, even currently, uh, people are stoned to death. Um, people are buried up to their neck in sand and then stoned. They don't survive it. But Paul survived it. And some people say that he was actually killed that day and came back to life. It's not in the scriptures, but that's a theory that's out there. But uh, it's certainly something to think about, the miracles that were in that man's life. Because he suffered the same fate as Stephen, and he held the coats, and he was there, and it ended up happening to him. Yeah, very, very good point. Wow. I appreciate those comments, Vern, but I wanted to go back to where you said that, um, <clears throat> talked about how did those people heal? How, did, how do they do things? And that <clears throat> has always been on my mind. <clears throat> and I want to share an experience with you that happened years ago in a small town um, that I was a city recorder of. And um, we had a neighbor they were the best neighbors that we've ever had. We lived down south of town, but they were the best neighbors we've ever had, and they were Pentecost. And the, and the wife was uh, the minister. And, but they were so God-loving and everything, and they shared things with me, and um, they weren't treated well. And she, they had a son, they owned a honey business, and um, the whole congregation worked there. And their son was um, a good kid and married. And he had an accident. Uh, he was up on the roof of the honey factory. And it was cold and snowy. And he slipped and he fell off. And he fell head first, two stories down, and landed on his head. And he broke every bone in his face and his neck that could be broken. And they airlifted him to Las Vegas because that was the closest hospital. And he survived. And they had a prayer service. And because they were neighbors, I volunteered to go. I wanted to go and pray with them. And it was, I didn't participate fully because they had everybody come up and People would sit on a chair and then they would come and place their hands on a certain part of their body and pray for, for the son with that body. And they asked me if I wanted to. I, that was just a little too far out for me, and I didn't, but I prayed. Well, things happened really well, and um, he, was, he was home, and his mouth was um, wired shut, and they had to pulverize everything and he'd suck his nutrients out of a out of a straw. Well, I was walking to work and because I only lived four blocks away and I was walking to work and this car pulled up on the main street and it was it was her. It was the mother. And she rolled the window down and she said, can you come and sit in the car with me for a sec? And I said, of course I can. So she said, what can you tell me about the LDS hospital in Salt Lake City? And I said, yeah, it's a good hospital. We've been there. Our son was born there. I was in there. My wife was in there. It's a good hospital. She said, well, I've got the impression that I'm supposed to take my son up to the LDS hospital. But she said, we've been mistreated so much. I have a really bad attitude about the church. And I said, oh, well, there's your, pro there's your problem solved. The church doesn't own the, t the hospital anymore. It, but they kept the name because everybody knows it. There was, the, there was the Holy Cross Hospital owned by the Catholics, and there was the LDS Hospital in Salt Lake. And us, you know, I mean, anyway, doesn't matter. <clears throat> and I said, but it is a good hospital. And she said, well, I feel inspired, but I've got to take my son there. And I said, well, then follow it. And she did. And what happened is she took her son up the 300 miles up to, to Salt Lake, got him, she knew where, I told her where the hospital was, and um, she got him in there. They walked into the hospital emergency entrance, 
and he collapsed on the floor. And the, it just so happened that the emergency room doctor of that day knew that he had a heart attack due to mal malnutrition. And they were able to revive him and get him up to a room. And the word came back, and she came, and she just did nothing but praise the Lord about that, about that she was glad that she talked to me. And, and I told her, I said, that is the hand of God there. But that baffled my mind because of being from where I came from. How can they do that? And then Suzanne and I were moving back up to Salt Lake, and so we went up and we checked this, apart, this house out that we were interested in. And while we were there, I said, let's go to the hospital and visit the, I can't, I can't remember their names, but anyway, so, uh, let's go out and visit them. And we did, and the husband and wife were there, and, we, and they were really surprised to see us there. But I said, hey, you guys are neighbors. We love you. You're spiritual people. We want to help you. And the dad said, would you mind praying with us? And I said, I would absolutely love it to pray with you. And we did, and he led the prayer, and it was a really spiritual prayer. And the Spirit testified to me, and I testified to them. And I remember their son's name was Donnie, and I said, Donnie's going to be healed. And he said, how do you know that? And I said, the Holy Spirit testified to me. And he did. And Suzanne and I walked out of there, and Suzanne said, that was really spiritual. But those people are Pentecost. And I said, but they're, they're God-fearing people. And I've seen that happen numerous times. And so it is a testimony to me that if you're God-fearing, God's going to answer you. Very good point. Very good point. And the bottom line is, is there anything, you know, it was asked in the Book of Mormon, is there anything too hard for our God? Now, Paul was stoned. We said they don't recover from stoning, and that's probably, mo that's most likely correct. But is the physical dissolution of the body too much for God to handle? Is the physical breaking of the body too much for God to handle? If these things, which are beyond our comprehension, too, not too great for God, why do we want to worry about things that affect us? Physically, mentally, whatever it is, why do we worry that? Why don't we trust? And how did all these things happen, except that those people that did it trusted? And what was said about the, 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 the Bible, we're reading this book, because there was somebody that was motivated enough to keep a record of what was going on. And that record made our faith come alive and gave us our faith. And we don't know who, who may be writing the, the history of our lives, lives today and what may be said years from now, if we get there. I don't know. It's, I don't know about that. But I do know that the book... The, the books of the Bible, they have a record that need to be told. And if it isn't going to be told by those who know it, it's going to be told by people who don't. And then what's going to happen? So I appreciate you guys uh, sharing and, and uh, um, indulging me. Uh, I've not been able to be in and out or in here on a regular basis. Sickness and travel. It, it's a troublesome thing sometimes. But let me share one other thing that, that it wasn't just accidental. I don't just go at a whim. Some people can. I, I'm not like that, really. But we went to a, a, a church uh, called Eastgate uh, down near Holden, Missouri. And there's a young man that was ordained a priest. And for the last three years, he's been, he, he's been fighting ALS. And the powerful thing is that is that he had a testimony even before he knew. But the powerful thing is that the humility that he brings, and he's a fighter. But we were able to witness that young man in, in his ordination. And it was just, I saw a difference in his face after the ordination. And he fought it for a while, but 
God is good. And even through the difficulties, we can be blessings to other people. And one other thing, it just strikes me, is it just, in the way of our superficial world, his wife is, is beautiful, young, just very, very talented. And you know, a lot of people that are in a situation like that where the wife is debilitated, the husband, they, they don't have the, the strength of character to do it. But this woman, this woman says that somebody's asking, it, asking her about it, and he, she says, well, it's helped me love him more. And while we had a potluck, and while we were there, she was feeding him. Now, that to me struck me as they're blessed. God is looking out for them, and that, that young lady is going to find a place in heaven that's beyond her imagination, that, that, to be willing to take care of one of God's servants like that. Anyway, I, I, it's a privilege, and thank you for listening, and I hope in the next service we receive the blessings of the Lord.